Hello. It took every ounce of strength not to do the hot stepper dance there, but I realize it's being recorded and I don't want to be a YouTube sensation. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, thanks for staying, guys. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. Um, essentially today, like, uh, like was just mentioned, I'm going to try and talk to you uh, a little bit about um, the sales content person analogy explained. That makes no sense to you guys at all yet, but hopefully by the end of it, it will. Uh, essentially, I have a habit of trying to make things a little bit simpler than they need to be. I don't think SEO needs to be that crazy difficult. I don't think it really is that crazy difficult. Um, so hopefully, in a nice, soft, light-hearted way, we'll get down to the end of it, because I know we are the last couple of people separating you from your beers. Um, so just a quick intro uh, to us. Um, Search Metrics uh, from Berlin, been around since 2005, and literally just doing everything to do with SEO and content. About me, quickly. Like, like was mentioned, I'm the director of search metrics in the UK. Um, been at agency side, been working with brands, and kind of done, done all of this all over the globe. A bit of a data geek, but hopefully it won't come across that way uh, when, when I'm showing you what's up. Um, so if you do need slides, we have them, so don't worry about uh, kind of overtaking pictures. I know they're also available here uh, through, uh, through the guys here. So let's get cracking. So. The way to think about things for me, and, and the way this kind of analogy starts, is essentially with the fact that your website is your store. And what I mean by that is the website that you have online is the equivalent to a department store, a store, an actual retail front, right? And when you're looking at that and you're imagining that concept, think about the fact that your website has content on it, over there on the left, or on the right, on the left on your side, and essentially, um, in the store, you have goods and services, right? The same thing. When we look at all of this, what's in between, right? What is in between those two? Because there's always a barrier to a conversion. There's always a barrier to a sale. So when we're thinking about that, online, there's a barrier, and in store, there's a barrier. What is it? Online, for us, at least in this context, I know there's a lot of barriers, and I know there's, there's a lot of different things that kind of stop people from buying and getting onto the site. But for our context in search, let's just say, Google is the barrier to kind of getting your content read, or at least being found. In store, the barrier is your salesperson. It's the shopkeeper. It's your rep, right? That's the person that's going to be selling the goods. That's the person that the customer is going to come in and talk to. So that's essentially the barrier there. Now, essentially, what's the aim? What do we want to do, both on the website, both in store? We want to do the same type of thing. You know, we need to help Google. How are we going to do that? We want to get people looking at the content and we want to get people talking to the salesperson, right? That's literally it. You know, hopefully the sales guy we've hired is good enough to kind of tell people what they need to know. And the aim is to get people doing that. So realistically, how are we going to do this? You know, there's a big, a big difference between how we're going to do it online and how we're going to do it in store. In store, to get people into the store, you're going to use branding, you're going to use loyalty, you've got word of mouth. You know, some people just turn up by accident because they walk past and see you. And then obviously you've got advertising. That's like one of the key things that people are doing to kind of get people in stores. When we're looking at search, what we really want to do is rank for as much positive content, so as much positive keywords and topics and different phrases around what we're selling to have people come in on store. So in Google, that obviously means keyword research, but actually that also means understanding like, the true breadth of a topic and a, and a journey for a user. And we'll come on to that a little bit more. At the end of the day, what that means is you want to be seen online. However people type, whatever they search, if it's relevant for you, you, you want to show up for it, right? Now, that brings us to a problem. Because if we look at this, there is a lot of online excess. This is a really old search. like. One, it's no one even looking for a Samsung Galaxy S7 anymore. But there's still about 1.7 million results, but only 10 of them are going to get traffic. So realistically, to stand out online, you're fighting online excess. And that means we have to work with Google to make this work for us. Right? So if you're thinking about it in that way, you know, the salesperson has ads to get his traffic, and you know, in store, he's one of, the, one of the means that he was going to get that was ads. For me, one of the things I think on the SERPs that are standing out at the moment is the SERP features. It's pretty much like a loud, in-your-face ad 
on the set. They interrupt your natural journey. In fact, if you look at it, they kind of become your natural journey now. This is just a random topic. My colleague Troy, somewhere in the crowd, likes to always use this example of the horse because it's just such a, such a crazy set. It's got so much on it. So what do we need to do? We, we need to do what Google wants. We need to help Google. But what does Google want? I mean, some people will say they just want money. Uh, you're prob probably not wrong. But realistically, what does Google actually want? Well, Google wants to get people where they want to get quickly. Because when people are unhappy and you don't do what they want, essentially, sometimes it doesn't work out for you, and you end up not looking great. I mean, you might have deserved it, but there you go. Um, and if you think about Google in general, Everything they've done up till now has been in aid of this mission, right? In 2011, you had Panda that was punishing poor content, uh, you know, prom and promoting uh, uniqueness. In 2012, you had Penguin, as you guys will know, it was like punishing all the dodgy leaks, manipulating the, the search. And then, obviously, you had Hummingbird, which is trying to understand more about kind of the actual context of the search, kind of understanding what's really going on on the page so they can make good, good decisions on where to rank you. And then, obviously, after that, Rank Brain came in and kind of made it all, made it all tied together and work even, even better. So realistically, at the end of it, what Google is trying to do is place the user at the center of their process. I mean, that's clearly because at the end of the day, what they want to do is keep everyone using Google. I mean, there's a reason you say Google it, and you, know, you don't want to Bing it, realistically. There's only a certain type of industry where really you go on Bing, and it isn't really for everything else. Um, so, you know, <laughs> there's a lot, actually, there's a funny one I like. This next one is one that I love. Sorry if you use Bing. Um, but <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> so, realistically, what we want to do is if you're trying to satisfy Google and you're trying to think about everything they're doing to make their engine better and everything work for them, you really want to be placing the user at the center of everything you're doing. So realistically, you want to have user centricity in your campaign. Everything you're doing, everything you're trying to do for content, you want to make sure that the user is kind of right at the center of that. Now, if you look at this, and you read just the, the standard wiki definition of what user-centric design is, or user-centric search in any case is, and you look at it where it's saying kind of placing that user at the heart, can you honestly say that in everything you're doing and everything you're trying to do, you're thinking about the user? I think a lot of the times when we're doing this, we forget that we're actually the user too. Like in a lot of the time in the journey, you forget how would you actually search? What do you actually do? And how do you do it? So realistically, when we're looking at it, how can we be user-centric? You know, users haven't got much patience. They're not, they're not trying to go around the place and find what they need. They really want to be spoon-fed and want to be searched. They, they're not going to go through the whole pinch and zoom. Have you seen those websites where you get on there and you have to like zoom in? You know, they're the worst. You jump straight off. If you can't find what you're looking for, you jump straight off. At this day and age, no one's got time to wait. If a page takes more than a couple of seconds to load, you move on. And that, again, if we keep thinking about the, the sales content personality, like how it works online and in store, it's pretty much the same in real life. If the UX, so if the design is terrible, you're not really going to want to use it, because you know, that's the case. You know, nobody wants to have that. OK? Now, if we take this a next step further, one of the things that people always say is you know, they didn't come to also admire your work. They came to accomplish their intention. If they can't do that, it's, it's not really working for them. You need to always be selling or always be closing. This, this always brings me to a scene from one of my favorite movies, Glengarry Glen Ross. See if it works. AIDA, get out there. You got the prospects coming in. You think they came in to get out of the rain? A guy don't walk on the lot lest he wants to buy. They're sitting out there waiting to give you their money. Are you going to take it? Are you man enough to take it? Are you man enough to take it? <laughs> That's it. I just wanted to know a bit of Alec Bolden in my speech there, to be fair. Um, but essentially, you see what I'm saying. They, they, they came for an attention. They wanted to do something. So how can we make that happen? Well, realistically, the user, when we look at this, we're going to show you a couple of steps. I'm going to show you, I think it's literally at six different points that will cover exactly what you want. Now, in doing this, I am going to show you some, some, some pictures and some things. If you don't have software and you're not doing it, you can always do this manually with your, with your ranks and pull it together. It might just take you a little bit longer, but you can still do this even if you don't have fancy software. So still, still think about how you can do it. What does the user want? All right. What are they looking for? There's nothing worse than being shown something that isn't really for you. This is actually a friend of mine. Um, I won't tell you her name, that's why I blocked it out. Um, essentially, there's, there's nothing worse than being in that predicament. You've got something you didn't even want, right? What is it that they're actually looking for? So when we're doing that, what we need to be thinking about in that game is understanding the true intent around 
a user journey. Essentially, when we're looking at it, we're looking at trying to figure out what's going on. So if you look at the bottom where we're looking at the tags, we're categorizing. What you need to do is look at all of your keywords, look at what you're thinking about as far as the topic, and categorize them into different buckets. Then sit there and figure out, well, which keywords are informational? Which keywords are navigational? Which ones are transactional? Is the user at the top of the funnel? Is the user at the middle of the funnel? Are they at the bottom of the funnel? And what type of content do I need to serve to them at every stage in that funnel? Break down your subsets. There's, there's a phrase that I learned once. It's called tofu, mofu, bofu. Like I say, top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and bottom of the funnel. Essentially, once you've done that, you can then compare your performance across each of them. Say, OK, well, in each of these, if I break them down further, when I go even further down the segments and get as granular as I can, how can we go in and get more information out of it? How can we understand which segment is doing better? If we start to understand exactly how we're performing in each of those, we can even start breaking down how our performance looks across those. You know, is a, has a competitor of ours increased in their rankings and their positions against us? And if they have, is that because they're increasing in transactional searches? Are they, are they performing better for informational content? Which one do we need to do? Okay? Once you know that, you know exactly what type of content you need to serve. The second thing is understanding how are they actually searching. You know, mobile can mean something different when you're searching. If you're typing Italian food in on your, on your on-the-go, you might get served a restaurant. If you're at home, you might want to be looking for recipes. It might mean something different, you know? So even if you're not thinking it, Google is thinking it. You know, it, it always looks a bit different when you're playing with it in different ways. So serve content in a way that makes it easy to consume, you know? Obviously, I, it's 2019, I shouldn't be mentioning responsive design, but, but here we are. You need to understand your users. So if you take that example I gave you with the tofu, mofu, both the top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and bottom of the funnel, look what you can start to do. If you can start to understand where your users are coming from, you can start to see that, oh, at the top of the funnel, people are searching a lot more on smartphone. In the middle of the funnel, it's looking a little bit different. And at the bottom of the funnel, actually, people are moving to way more of a desktop search. If you're thinking like that, then you can start to actually customize their, their search journey. Imagine if you're on your phone and you can create a journey specifically for someone on your phone. If you're going at the desktop level and you're at the bottom of the funnel to try and convert, you can optimize your content and make it work specifically for someone who's at the bottom of their journey. So really, once you figure out the attribution, it helps all of the rest of the channels. You know, SEO is at the center. You've got so much information that you can actually help the rest of the channels work. Because you can tell people, well, actually, they're searching a lot more on mobile. We can target them here. We can target them there. We can really make this work, right? So that's the next step. Now, what you want to do from that is figure out how you can serve your content to best meet those points, right? And what I mean by that is when you're thinking about content, good content should be spliced. I mean, that this what you see here, it's actually called, I have to read it because I can never pronounce it, it's kintsugi, right? It's the Japanese art of fixing the broken pottery and they use kind of a bit of gold to do it. Now, what this essentially means is that they're trying to take something and make it even better, turn it into something different. In the same way, when you're thinking about your content, if you've written a piece of content, you should be thinking about how you might be able to chop that content up into something different. Can you turn one piece of content into an infographic? Can you turn it into a video? Can you turn it into a table? Obviously, don't just do it to do it. But the point is, you want to break it down into a format that might be absorbable in a different way, because that's eventually going to help the user. In essence, you need to pivot. You need to pivot that data and turn it into something a little bit different, a little bit better. So you know, make sure that that's something you're focusing on. Also, like I say, it has to be relevant. If you're thinking about relevance, you know, it needs to provide answers to as much of the person's questions as possible because that's how you're going to make it work. So here's an example. If you're thinking about kind of pesto ingredients, you're going to want short content. You don't need a whole essay about that. If you're thinking about kind of quick answers like Google serving now, like what time's the Chelsea game, it's going to come up. Halloween costumes for images, even how to contour like Kim Kardashian. Now, you can, you can say what you want about that, but she's clearly got the SERP game down, or the people who are around her, they, she's got everything. Have a look. Um, so, it's clear that it can be done well. So what's the next bit? This is one of the ones that I think is really, really important. Google's research and development. If they rank it, it works. Google knows a lot about you. Google spends a lot of money, just like Tim. They're going to want to find out a lot more about you. Google looks at your traffic. They look at your user signals. They look at bounce rate. They look at user flow. They look at everything. They're reading the content on the page. They know so much about you. So if they're ranking pages in those ways, you know what Google wants to see. So let me give you an example. Here's a tip, if you haven't done it already. Look at the top when you type a search term in, what Google's showing you around it. There's a reason they're showing you. Here's what I mean. If you type in Halloween costume, you can see all images shopping. 
because Google probably thinks that you want to look at images. If you're looking at costume ideas, all images shopping, because Google thinks you want to look at images. Then when you go to Halloween costumes online, Google thinks you probably want to buy something, so it goes all shopping and then images. It's already giving you a clue as to what type of content you probably need to think about creating. If you're already writing about one thing and images are what's, what's needed, stick some images in. Make sure you're paying attention to the little things that Google is already telling you. They're literally telling you what's important. One size does not fit all. You know, you want to make sure that when you're looking at this, you're breaking that down. Look at your SERP features, analyze them however you can, analyze them and understand. Look, just for the process of understanding it, in this graph, what you're seeing on the gray bars is how much a market is responding. What, what's the industry, for the keywords we're looking at in this case, what's the industry doing? The blue bars are how much this particular, this particular Amazon uh, page was performing for those keywords. Now, you can see that means that we probably need to be thinking about images. We probably need to be thinking about, think about related questions. We want to cover all of these things. But again, get granular. Start to look at a specific part of those keyword sets. Because if I now look at motors at the top, you can see it's motors, the entire landscape changes. So that means that when I'm thinking about motors, I probably need to think about probably video a bit more. I probably need, still need to think about images, still need to think about related questions, but video is shot up. And that means that that's probably something I need to do. I need to talk to either my client, I need to talk to my team and think, hey, people are looking for video content. We should probably think about providing it in some way, shape, or form. So really, if Google is doing that and they're ranking it, it works. And the same thing applies when you're looking at the competitors. If you look at the top guys for the keywords and the content and the topics that you're ranking for, and they have a table, they have a chart, and they're doing this. Google probably wants you to have those things. You just have to do it, but do it better than them. Give the user something else that they need to know. Get granular. Now, when we go down, essentially, we go to the next point. Answer all of the questions. Go back to the content salesman. Think about how you search online. Okay? These are the questions you're asking the guy in store. Do you have it, number one? What's some general information about it? Is there any warranties? Is there any aftercare details? Is there any technical details? Just because you search like that in store, it doesn't mean you're going to search completely differently online. How do you search online? You look at something, then you'd go off and you might look somewhere else. You go off and you might look somewhere else. You go off and you might look somewhere else to find out more information. But then what can happen in that journey is if that's what your user's doing, they might end up somewhere else and then buy. But if you're providing all the information around a topic that they need, why would they ever go and do that? They've already got the information. They already know about the warranty. You're already telling them all the information that they need to know. That's what you want to do. So again, this is from our side, but you can do this manually. Sit there and figure out, when you're doing keyword research, don't just do it in an Excel table. Don't just put it all together. I, I'm a paper person myself. I like to sit there with a pen and paper. Write the keyword, and then think about how a topic graph looks. Try to recreate this. If you can't get it, try to recreate it. Section 21 is all about mortgages and, well, evicting people from your house because they're not paying rent. And you can start to see one of the things links to another, one of the things links to another. If you're thinking about Section 21 and you're trying to cover that content, you might want to think about a tenancy notice letter. You might want to think about how to evict a customer. You might want to think about all the other things that connect to that topic and make it work. So when you're doing your keyword research, just sit there with a pen and paper, write the topic, link one bit to another, think if that can be made to a separate piece of content or if it, clear, like it clearly covers that topic you're trying to work for. After that, Focus on all the questions. There's loads of places you can get this. Answer the public. Uh, people always ask, even just Google searches in general. Figure out all of the other questions around the topics that you need to then answer. Answer them. Put them in your FAQ section. Put them in your blog. Write a separate blog article around them. Create content around that to make it work. Right? After this, we come to the last point. Nothing too difficult. This is not a difficult presentation to understand. Once you come to the last bit, all you need to do is sell upsell and cross-sell that content. And what I mean by that is if we go back to the previous graph and we go back there, essentially, that means internally link. You know, think about how you're connecting one piece of content to the next piece of content. If I'm serving you this piece here and this is also relevant, tell me it's relevant. Show me clearly that, oh, I could probably, you, you might be interested in this. You know, annoyingly enough, the Daily Mail, when you're looking at kind of the showbiz trash, keeps doing that and you keep scrolling to the next one because they think you're going to like this, they think you're going to like that, they think you're going to like this. They're doing the same thing. They're kind of understanding what you might like, and they're showing you what might help you. If you're buying a watch, you might want to know about the warranty information. You might want to know how to compare it. And if you're shown that on your site, it's going to be really easy for you to start clicking around the page and get stuck in there. It's like the same thing. If you do it really, really, really well, eventually, 
you might end up on a meme like this, because that's what happens. On YouTube, it's the same thing. You end up watching these trash videos till like seven in the morning, you don't even know how you started doing it. But the reason you're doing it is because they're showing it to you and you're in the endless cycle. People can be like that on your site, right? If you do all of this well and you combine all of these things together, what you should end up with is something that looks like this. You should end up with a piece of content that covers every different aspect of my need in different formats. So, you know, if one part of that topic requires a video, stick it in there, help me see it. Like we said for cars, if I'm looking at a review, it's probably a lot easier for me to watch a one-minute review, two-minute review, than read through a whole piece of paper. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't give me a blog article about it, but it might help. If I want pictures, it's going to help. Put all the different bits in and make one piece of content that clearly covers that full piece of that, that topic in its fullest. Now, that doesn't mean to say you shouldn't specialize. Specializing is great if you think that those topics can be elsewhere, if you think they can link to other things and create their own page and they deserve their own page, do that. But the point is, even when you're doing that, think about how you can make that content the best by covering every aspect of that user's journey properly. And that's literally it. There's not much more to it. Thank you very much for your time, guys.